uh, as the fifth generation approaches its uh, responsibilities, uh, you're dealing with a China that over three decades has gone through a, a totally unprecedented level of uh, economic development. And in some ways, the society and its economy have outgrown the political system that led to the communists taking over China uh, in 1949. So a one-party authoritarian government now is ruling over a society that is totally wired, that's uh, involved in world affairs, its economy is totally linked to the world, and uh, the new leadership is going to have to figure out how it deals with kind of disparity between its governance and the way the society and the economy function. We know that uh, from the grass, grassroots up, there's uh, concern about uh, corruption, about in, income inequality, uh, and uh, whether the party is really listening to the people. Uh, cell phones and uh, internet traffic indicates that the population knows what's going on in the world as well as in its own environment, environs, and there are serious uh, problems there. So will the pattern of leadership that uh, the party has uh, enjoyed uh, without a lot of uh, debate and uh, pressure from below, will that be uh, sustained? And I think the answer is no. From my recent trips to China, senior people will say that uh, public pressure is something that the leadership really has to worry about. Um, not too uh, many years ago, there was a split within the leadership about how to deal with that uh, pressure. That was 1989, and the events that uh, we talk about as Tiananmen were a good example of where a younger generation wanted to see changes, and the leadership wasn't prepared to accept them. Actually, the leadership then split. You had reform element under Zhao Ziyang and a more conservative element uh, that Deng Xiaoping led that uh, basically crushed the opposition but sustained the economic development. Well, the U.S.-China relationship is a complex one. Uh, our two societies, certainly economically, are highly interdependent. Uh, a million and more Chinese young people have studied in our universities. Uh, most of them go back to China. And so the, there's a positive level of interaction there that uh, is the upside, but there is a high level of distrust. And uh, there's been a recent study uh, that, that documents concerns on the Chinese part that, uh, while it sounds strange to us, that we're trying to uh, constrain China, we're trying to uh, prevent its uh, economic growth or its emergence as a world power, which really is beyond our capacity, even if we wanted to do it. Uh, and where repeated American administrations say we want a strong and prosperous China, yet uh, from the Chinese side there is this uh, concern that we're, we're opposed to. On the American side, as is evident in our public debates, there's the feeling that uh, the Chinese, particularly in the economic area, uh, have not uh, worked with a level playing field, concerned about theft of intellectual property, uh, currency manipulation, denying market access, all which are real issues. China's main concern, or the main concern of the leadership, frankly, is internal stability. And we know that for many years their major concern has been maintaining a growth rate. We've seen at the 10 percent level, they wanted to ha have wanted it at least the 7 percent level so that they don't have an unemployment problem, that the people coming in from the rural areas do find jobs, much less that the people who have been employed in the coastal provinces lose their jobs. So that, in my view, is going to be the major concern, the major focus of this new leadership and uh, their direction and their view of their place in the world is really going to center around how their economic dealings with the world, how their uh, territorial disputes with Japan or whoever are managed, but as they play to their internal situation. And the need for stability 
rooted in economic growth.